and uh it's really grown on me that intro uh welcome back to deeper slow horus i think last time you were on we talked about nightmare of all things absolutely yeah no, um, my yeah. favorite subject yeah we did great <laughs> i watched all of them to prepare for that the whole seven series <laughs> uh well enter stranger welcome back um you're you're joining me for an adam curtis review and uh horus um has done quite a bit of history content in the past uh can people still watch that is that still online anywhere or yeah although i've even thought about taking them off because i'm so um, i'd say i'm superseding that now with what i'm doing on substack just been posting stuff since january on substack i've only done three essays on there so far i'm writing a much longer one at the moment <laughs> as if they weren't long enough already um but yeah this one's going to be god knows how long um, so yeah, it's going back over some of the same material, but deeper, better, more in detail, more scrupulous. So uh, I, I recommend people take a look. Eternalhorus.substack.com. Yeah, no, you did mention that you're actually away at the moment and you're broadcasting from a kitchen, which is why you sound a bit echoey. Like some Sorry. people have. Um, I just explained that we can't do anything about. Horus' sound is just a little bit... Uh... There are a few different settings on my mic, so I'll try those, and you can just tell me if they're any better. I'm trying them now. I'm trying another one. Is that any better? Yeah, I mean, you sound good to me. It, to me, it sounds fine. Um, I, I'll just remind everyone, uh, do buy my uh, courses. The promo code MELLOW gets you 25% off, and uh, I think I played the Foundations of Politics ad. I very rarely play that one, so... I'll play that, and then when we come back, Horus, we're going to be watching <laughs> Black Power episode of Pandora's Box, which is all about the independence of Ghana, which is a very obscure topic for Curtis to be picking up on, but we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. Foundations of Politics, only £350. Buy it now. See the world as it is and not how it ought to be. History is the graveyard of aristocracy. Who says organization says oligarchy? Who decides? Who interprets? The extremes of individualism and socialism meet. That was their predestined course. Foundations of politics. Only £350. Buy it now. All right, so... Just before we get going, uh, I mean, we're going to watch the whole thing and we're going to do the, the usual thing of pausing as we go. But, you know, so far on Pandora's box, Curtis has been looking at kind of uh, ideas around science and scientific management. He's looked at the Soviet Union. He's looked at Britain, Keynesianism a little bit. Um, last episode was about uh, DDT. Um, why do you think that he spends this whole episode looking at the Gold Coast and the independence of Ghana, Horus? Like, what is the is there a conceptual tie in to the rest of the series? Do you think I'll, I'll say it's consistent with one of his themes in that he likes stories of failure, right? Of, of great visions that just crumble into failure, uh, which yeah. I think uh, not, not to spoil this for everyone, but uh, it doesn't all go as planned. I will say that. And, and then it things. failed, yeah. And then it yeah, failed. and like the receding of British power is obviously something he, he talks about plenty as well. Uh, you haven't done the Mayfair set, but I'm looking forward to that one. And uh, obviously, in Oceans Apart, uh, and Ocean Apart, that was uh, you know about the decline of Britain as well. This is this one is obviously about Ghana, but that you know it's as Britain shrivels, the British Empire shrivels, and you know the fruit drop off sort of thing. Uh, and it's about it's partly about America coming in. I don't know if you've watched this one yet, but it's. America coming in and uh, supplanting British influence to some extent as well. 
that is something mm. he's revisited quite a lot. So um, it fits Top, that topic that interests well, me as well. The, the he's also sorry. I was just going to say he's also a critic of Marxism as well. And Kwame Nkrumah, who's sort of the star of this one, was a Marxist. Um, and like, it's one thing I like about Curtis for a leftist and someone who's very much a critic of capitalism. Um, he is also very anti-Soviet and uh, not not friendly to Marxism at all. So. Yeah, he's a very interesting figure, is Curtis. And, you know, uh, I mean, just before we get going, I've always found him difficult to place. He reminds me a little bit of the of the writer John Gray. I don't know if you've come across him at all. Um, you know, he's nominally a leftist, but he's like a former, a former kind of neoliberal, right? He kind of supported Thatcher for a while. Yeah. But then became disillusioned with Thatcherism and the whole liberal project, and now John Gray is kind of on on the left, and he's on Radio Four and stuff like that. But basically, everything he does is critical of current power structures, while also being skeptical of Marxism, utopian visions, um, and really, John Gray is the only other figure like Adam Curtis that I can think of, who is very, very difficult to place. But uh, if you had to place Curtis, like what's he up to? Where, where's he coming from? He's almost, he's almost like, there's, there's almost no one like him. Um, I, I mean, he, the re it's exactly for the reason you said that, that we all talk about him on the right. <laughs> if we yeah. are the right anymore, I mean, it's all blurring, isn't it? But he is as unconventional as leftists get. I think. Um, I mean, to the point where you could watch quite a lot of his programmes and not realise he was a leftist at all. And that's a compliment. On the other hand, uh, when he did that series a few years ago, Can't Get You Out of My Head, it all came flooding back. It was horrible, I thought, that one. Uh, sorry, I keep I keep leaping ahead to further on in the Curtis connection. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, he, he also, in recent years, I think, has become a bit more cowardly or crypto yeah. in a way yeah. where he doesn't want to signal support for populism or trump so you know, that came well, through in hypernormalization definitely it starts by portraying trump as just this wacky thing with no explanation like how the hell did this happen like yeah. for me it was not really that much it was kind of a surprise that donald trump specifically but that kind of um gobby american populism was no surprise like you know, yeah. a useless kind, a Zionist kind. But I, I, I mean, I, I, I've noticed in, rec in recent years, rather than, crit rather than criticizing our regime, he'll kind of show us what Putin is doing in Russia right. as a parallel to what our system is doing. I wonder what the atmosphere at the BBC is like now. Um, you know, can you be now what Curtis was 20 years ago? Is that even possible? Would you get commissioned? Mm. I, I noticed he's got a personal blog as well that he just stopped writing in after 2016. Yeah. Or like recent years, there's no entries at all, which is weird because you think, well, now is the most politically interesting and furtive time, but he's just gone to ground. And I just think he's probably he's probably thinking I'm on thin ice here. I could be cancelled at any minute, basically. So Yeah, and, and I wonder as well, are the left, as I mean, intelligent leftists, especially like him, are they, are they, you know, sophisticated ones who have developed their own ideas? They're not just herdish. Do are they becoming somewhat nervous about at least the erosion of? <laughs> I often wonder how much leftists wonder about the erosion of the Tories and obviously the Republicans and stuff like the erosion of credibility of the centre right, which I have for quite a long time thought of as their bulwark, you know, their yes, key yeah. bastion, right? Um, I I wonder how the world looks to yeah, thinking leftists right now and how, you know, we look. I mean, you've just appeared on GB News. That's another little brick out of the wall, you know? A little, yeah, I mean, a little, iro a little ironically, cut. though, Horace, in the week that I launched big time the Zero Seats campaign, I, that was the week I was on GB News. So yeah, with a like, Tory MP. <laughs> I know, isn't it bizarre? But uh, anyway, <laughs> and 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 Mog Mog seem, I assume Mog knows who you are roughly, and he's he seems to have no problem with you at all, which is just amazing. I mean, I'm you know I'm one step away from you, and I'm calling for people like Mog to well, we're all calling for Mog to be out of Parliament just along with the rest of them. 
and yeah. yet he has you on as a guest. It's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, he was he was more amenable to some of the elite theory points I was making. Um, I mean, it, I, how can I put this? I kind of felt like, um, and we will get to the documentary in a second, but you know, uh, I always talk about pro wrestling and kayfabe, right? Yep. Um, I kind of felt like I was go, I was somebody going on a pro wrestling show and talking like a smart fan, right? And Sorry, I eat what, the... what, what is a smart fan? So, so in the world of wrestling, right? Wrestling is fake for us, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. It's predetermined. Mm -hmm. The wrestlers are cooperating. Yeah. Like, they, yeah, like, yeah. A, like they're acting. There's like a determined okay. outcome. Yeah. Right. But back in the old days, everybody kind of bought into it, just like when you watch a film and you buy into the reality of the film. Right? At the age of the seven, I did not buy into it. I knew it was ridiculous. <laughs> so you, you, right. So you could say, well, you were smartened up at the age of seven, right? Well, I believed in the Ultimate Warrior, but everyone else was kayfabe. Yeah. <laughs> um, so essentially a smart fan back in the day was somebody who kind of knew the kind of it was all predetermined it was a business they knew kind of the tricks of the trade and that really you know backstage hulk hogan and andre the giant were mates they weren't actually enemies if that makes any sense mm -hmm. um and i i felt like i was i was a little bit like somebody breaking breaking the kayfabe in there and um you know i saw i saw mog shift in his seat a couple of times maybe he was thinking like well we could be having this conversation but possibly you know a dinner or something not not on tv and then immediately afterwards there were those two women and they were literally within minutes talking about salad and pineapples and it was just so bizarre you know um like to blow away the sort of residue of of, of your 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 truth bonds <laughs> exactly like uh, let's get back to the kayfabe of right versus left and tory versus labor and the culture wars and all that sort of stuff so um it's really, it's really it, strange what happens on gb news i just saw like was it is it that jack anderton and some other people like just sort of anon accounts on twitter started posting these um like sexual offense, like sexual assault and rape statistics that were all over Twitter last night and today. And within a couple of hours, like early like this morning, Patrick Christie's had picked it up and he's sort of just centre ground, isn't he? I mean, he's like, mm. yeah, I mean, he's, it doesn't seem like a bad guy, but um, yeah, it's like they, they kind of, they are listening, they're, they're, they're scanning all this, this the, whole sphere. It's funny. The, uh, the impression I get, uh, Horus, and uh, it's hard for me to tell because I'm not an insider, right? I'm not part of. The Westminster world, and I'm not part of, you know, I, I'm independent. I'm not part of anything, and I've never been part of anything. But the impression I get is that in all of these places, right, um, whether it's the New Culture Forum, or GB News, or Reform, or any of these, any of these outlets, there's a generational divide basically between the old guard, who are boomers and who are kind of living in their own world. And people who are closer to our age or maybe a bit younger who are internet savvy and kind of get some of the ideas that me or you would talk about or, you know, they're kind of plugged into what you might call the intellectual right a bit more. Um, and that's my that's my impression that there's currently a bit of a disconnect in a way between, let's say, Richard Tice and all the all the 30 year olds under Richard Tice or the you know, uh, whoever the big wigs are at GB News and all of the kind of staff there. If does that make sense? Um, well, that's the impression I get. Uh, yeah, impression. It surprises me because I mean, Patrick Christie's. I mean, as I say, he's fairly centre right, but he's younger than us. I mean, Darren Grimes is obviously pretty young. Occasionally, I've seen him actually take the right position on something, but uh, it's, I don't know. I mean, Neil Oliver, he must be sort of, well, he's Gen X, like old Gen X or something, isn't he? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I, I don't see the generation thing there. Like, I mean, Albie, what is he, like mid 20s or something? He's just a leftist, isn't he? Well, I mean, there um, are some, there, see, the thing is, though, there are some people on in those spots who are almost like kind of system generated. It's almost like they could be yeah. AIs. Who's that guy on uh, Tom Harwood, for example? Oh, God, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And I, I remember, I mean, I won't name who this person was, but I, I was talking to someone fairly well-known 
rights on in one of these networks once an older chap and i was like you know some of the people on gb news are right but why is harwood there and he was like oh come on you know tom does a solid job and all of this i was like dude what planet are you on like it's a solid you know, job for our enemies yeah <laughs> it's just like you, you understand what i mean right so there, there is this kind of i get the impression that there are some some of these people who almost like live in a different world it's like they're still their mind is 20 years ago or something um mm. and there are other people who very much understand what are going on and they're both working in the same places you know so there we i are. think there's like lobbying interests have their have their influence on uh, on gb news as well i think you know that that's uh, that yimby uh, phenomenon which tom harwood is one of the sort of bigger mm -hmm. voices in that to me that just smells of direct payments from house building firms like <laughs> just you know red row balfour b whatever like they are just buying young guys to make it seem youthful and cool to support you know massive levels of immigration and as much house building as possible well, yeah i mean i mean with, without getting on too much of a digression the const the construction firms are have always been big backers of the tories yeah always. The, the yeah the what one of two main um you know pay pays uh, payers of the tory party along with another one i won't mention so, all right, we're going to get started on Am Curses. Um, now, as ever, this episode needs to get for us 7.8 thousand views in one week for Adam Curtis to continue. Most of them have been doing it within two days. But I'm a bit worried with this one because the independence of Ghana is not obviously <laughs> It's not obviously clickbait, I'll just say that. <laughs> Who's not here for Kwame and Krumah chat? I, I don't really bring much of a crowd either, but I believe we can at least generate some controversy, if nothing else, just cheap, you know, just like tawdry uh, <laughs> trouble causing, if nothing else, by the end. So we'll be all right. All right, let's, uh, let's, let's play. Let's go. If you were a scientist, you were in. I'll just say as we're watching these credits, Curtis loves, and I mean loves, the idea of big science at the, at the kind of mid-century point or early 20th century kind of sci-fi stuff. He's just, it's, that's very much in his wheelhouse. Um, and it's all over the title sequence of Pandora's box. <laughs> you you had a guest on a week or two and you were just clocking all the, all the, classic Curtis tropes that just repeat through all the series. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, you know, like Mars Attacks or the Jetsons or this, just that that oh, kind yeah. of imagery. I've got a book here um, uh, called Welcome to Mars, Pop uh, Politics, Pop Culture and Weird Science in the 1950s uh, by uh, Ken Hollings, right? And I turn on the back. Ken Holling shows brilliantly the web of technologies that drove the Cold War by Adam Curtis. Adam mm -hmm. Curtis is literally the back quote on the book. So that is his wheelhouse. He just loves that 1950s uh, science idea. But anyway, let's carry on. Your excellent science. I'm your faithful servant. Building a new world. Thirty-five years ago, one man set out to turn this country into a modern industrial utopia. I, I, I sorry to pause it again, right? But I have to mention this. I'm one of the few. I'm one of the few people who knows anything about football in any of our spheres, and my sole knowledge of Ghana comes from a little five-minute documentary that was done by Marcel Desailly, the former Chelsea defender, hmm. uh, a France defender. And the only thing I can remember about it was him going in Ghana, in Ghana. That was it. That was the whole. That was the whole thing. And um, 
you know, it just looked like any other place in Africa. I was always, I is, he, is he of Ghanaian background? Well, he was he was a French Ghanaian. Uh, yeah, he won the World Cup, didn't he? In 98. And he won the World Cup with France, but... But I just thought Ghanaian spoke English, so I was just surprised. Uh, yeah, it's kind of kind of weird. But uh, mm. yeah, a lot of the French team were from Ghana. I think, uh, don't quote me on this, but there was a player called Bruno Ingotti, uh, Lillian yeah. Turam. I think they were all like West, massive, big West African guys, you know. Mm. Um, but they all ended up playing for France somehow. But. Desai was a superb player, and and Chiram as well, really world class. Yeah, I love I love that French team. I really did. Um, I don't. I don't. I bloody hated them winning that World Cup. Ugh. I <laughs> loved Ronaldo, and he just he didn't turn up. Something. Well, he did. He played, but it was this just in, in 98, the final. Ninety eight World Cup, wasn't it? Yeah, I just loved Ronaldo. He was like he's basically my favorite striker at least ever, and um, apart from you know a few others, but <laughs> he he was just the most thrilling player. And um, in the final. He didn't, he just, for, something was wrong. He had some fit or something, didn't he? For the Zoomers, uh, Horace is talking about fat Ronaldo. The, the, Ronaldo, yeah. The real yeah, Ronaldo. The, the, that Ronaldo, not Cristiano Ronaldo. And uh, I remember there were all sorts of conspiracy theories and rumours as to like what happened. He was ill or yeah. he was just ill on the day, wasn't he? Yeah. If there's I, footy, if there's young footy fans watching and you've never seen Brazilian Ronaldo, La Phenomenona or whatever, yeah, the phenomenon is electrifying the th just, oh, anyway off topic yeah let's get let's get back anyway my sole knowledge of ghana comes from that five minute marcel desai clip from 20 years ago so yeah he was kwame and krumah the first leader of a newly independent black african state his aim was to transform ghana into a society shaped and driven by the power of science bringing up cities of Ghana, becoming the metropolis of science, learning, scientific agriculture, and philosophy. Seek ye first the political kingdom, and all other things shall be added unto it. We are then the nation for our home. We At the heart of Nkrumah's plan was a giant dam that would produce vast quantities of cheap electricity. But then it failed. <laughs> it's just a wait. classic Curtis opening, isn't it? And I, I like this power. propaganda song they're singing as well. It's like quite a charming song for a propaganda. It's nice. To build a modern industrial state in the heart of Africa within a generation. But what Nkrumah did not foresee was that with the dam would come other, more dangerous forms of power which he could not control. Political and economic forces that would tear apart his vision of using science and technology to create a model for the new Africa. Nkrumah was, in my mind, a visionary, not a dreamer. In his mind's eye, he could see the uh, United States of Africa as the United States of America, and you could see... No, no, no can I, can, sorry to keep on interrupting, Horace, but, you know, long-time viewers of this channel um, will know, and newer members should go back and check out. I had a series back in the day called The Economic Policies That Failed, dot, 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 and one of them was on Venezuela, but most of them were on African countries. I did Liberia, I did Haiti, which is not African, but kind of is. Um, I did uh, uh, Ethiopia and, and I'm Tanzania trying to remember. One as well. Tanzania yeah. was a disaster. And I did um, Zimbabwe as well. And one of the things that I found in all of those places um, was, was the constant problem of tribalism within each African nation state. So the what usually happens in all of these failed states is that one faction, one tribe gets into power and basically just uses that power to screw over all of the other tribes in a, in a very vampiric way. Um, and this is really one of the issues. And I, I notice I, even a successful African country like Botswana 
when I went, I went over there a few years ago. Uh, I went on a safari, and it was it was my honeymoon. Actually, lovely place. But um, I noticed that when people introduce themselves, they would always introduce themselves from their tribe. They wouldn't say, "Oh, I'm I'm a Botswana," and they'd they'd be like, "Oh, I'm a Bushman from this place," or "I'm from this tribe." And all of the um, all of the infrastructure there and all of the businesses were basically run by white South Africans in all of the leadership and management roles. And like the locals were just kind of workers basically being told what to do. Uh, so that was, that is something that I have noticed in all of these places that the persistent problem of those tribal affiliations above the national affiliations. I don't know then, if that's uh, at, yeah at the national level as well. You've got like Nkrumah here, plus there was like Nereri in Tanzania and some of the other countries you mentioned, like Mugabe was a Marxist. They're all Marxists as well. So from the top down, you're also getting Marxism imposed on this potentially impossible anyway tribal situation. It, absolutely, yeah. But then the the thing is, is that Marxism is never very good at um, let's just say motivating a nation. So, like, for example, in the case of Mugabe, it, it kind of transformed over time to a, a really virulent kind of anti-white type of nationalism. Um, Although that Mark, doesn't stop yeah. them partnering up with the US, though. <laughs> no, no, well, of course, yeah, of course, it's, <laughs> of course not. But uh, anyway, let's get, let's get, so that, those, are, those are kind of some of my observations on other African countries. And I'm wondering how many of those things we're going to see in Ghana here, because uh, I'm I'm pretty sure the problem of tribalism is going to come up. The Africa coming together to form a viable unit uh, to become a, a world power in the shortest possible time. Now on, there is a new African in the world. He needed power, and there was no source from which he could get the amount of power which he needed. And this was the one source which could provide him with that power. And he was prepared to go the whole length to get it. We begin in West Africa, one of the two great areas of the world where we have ruled but never settled. I, I just want to say, you know, see that guy with the globe, right? Hmm. If that was our ruling class, I'd just accept it. I'd just be like, I'm cool with, with them ruling us. But I am not. I am much less happy with the current ruling class. If it was all just posh men in kind of nice-looking offices, swiveling around globes like that, I'd, I'd have much less of a problem. The face uh, fits, at least, doesn't it? Yeah, mm. I, I've, I've always thought that, that the... You know, even though their actual decisions may not be that good, as we'll see here, I, I've always had less of a problem with the kind of old British ruling class of this era. Um, anyway, let's carry on. The people of the Gold Coast, there came last week a day that will always be remembered in their history. For here, in what's been a British colony for more than a century, nearly a million people went to the polls in their first general election. The main issue in the election lay between those who want self-government sometime in the future and those who want it now, like the Convention People's Party, the CPP. Their leader, Kwame Nkrumah, spent election day in jail, serving a sentence for incitement and sedition. Nkrumah's rise had been irresistible. <laughs> After spending 10 years in America... Uh, probably, deserve, probably deserved. Curtis okay. doesn't, have, doesn't have so much to say about that, does he? <laughs> <laughs> As a student, he had returned to the Gold Coast in 1947. Within two years, he had formed a political party. Two years after that, he swept to power. Although the British still controlled trade, defence and foreign policy, he had become the first black African prime minister. Nkrumah, before coming into power, has, in his election manifesto, had made certain promises about uh, development, about turning the country into a modern industrial country. Nkrumah very much believed that for development power was necessary, that you had to have power, that without power you couldn't develop. Power meant electricity, and the source was to be the giant Volta River that flowed through the eastern half of the country. 
Ever since the 1920s, the British had planned to build a dam there. A hydroelectric plant would produce electricity to make aluminium from the Gold Coast's vast reserves of the mineral bauxite. In the early 50s, Britain was desperate for a cheap source of aluminium, and Krumer joined with the British to resuscitate the scheme. I mean, just from nuts and bolts economics for us, it's not a bad idea, is it? They've got, they've got aluminium, the world needs it, let's build a dam and get it out the mountains and ship it out. Why not? Well, um, nuts and bolts <laughs> economics to me is like Mises and Rothbard, and I would say it depends whether it's going to make a profit and uh, how much things cost and, yeah, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of things that, you don't, that we don't get told about this, really. I mean, it, you know, it, it sounds to me a bit like a sort of, Tennessee Valley Authority, you know, Hoover Dam sort of project. It is like right. it might just be for stimulus. I'm not. I'm not really sure. Well, his his idea is to create a lot of cheap electricity. Obviously, um, it, it could be a good thing, but I, I would be skeptical. This is the Volta, the greatest natural resource of the Gold Coast, whose latent power is the mainspring of the most visionary development project in the whole of Africa. And this is bauxite, which lies in millions of tons beneath the green forested hills of the Gold Coast. From this red earth, man can extract the shining wonder metal of today, aluminium. And that is the aim of the Gold Coast, to cap the march to independence with a dramatic leap into the age of technology. The British authorities saw the power from the dam simply as a means to boost the empire's supply of aluminium. But for Nkrumah, it was much more. He saw it as the key to fulfilling his country's destiny. The power was originally conceived just for the manufacture of aluminum in this country. But then when Kwame came, he gave a new uh, accent, a new importance to that power project. That was the power was to be used for a comprehensive economic development of the country. <laughs> Together, Nkrumah and the British organized a traveling exhibition to promote the Volta scheme. Large models of the dam were built and taken round the country amidst a blaze of publicity. The exhibition was seen by nearly two million people. Some elderly folks, their reaction was first, is it possible, is it feasible for this to happen in their lifetime? And I remember in one particular place, there was one farmer who came in in the plot and did ask the question, what can he do to help for the project to come on? The two mobile cinemas range the country ahead. Uh, now, I'll just say that one potential problem with this whole plan that I can see already, Horus, uh, is a problem that a lot of former colonies did actually face, and that is an over-reliance on a single export good yeah. i mean it's a very aluminium focused what if there's no demand for aluminium or uh what i'd be thinking if i was this chap is yeah okay but what else can ghana have in its economy that so we're not just we don't have all our eggs in the aluminium basket because um th that's how a lot of these economies end up in trouble because one bad thing happens to that good one bad year and their economy's because it's imbalanced basically so. yeah um it and it really it can make your country a hostage to optimism as well i think um because you saw what happened in venezuela um chavez and maduro made plans based on the expectation that oil would stay above a certain price as a commodity obviously aluminium is another I, I believe a commodity with a global market yeah, you cannot. You, if you're going to make any plans based on commodity prices, you've got you've got a plan for historic lows for lasting for a long time. You really like low prices. I mean, otherwise you're just crazy. You just you're just gambling your country's future. I um, I, I noticed uh, I've watched this before and I forgot, but he said like he says that this this project was actually being promoted in partnership with the British Empire. Yeah. So I wonder if the British at the time were expecting Ghana to stay within the empire and just have its sort of internal autonomy. As part of that, it, you know, as part of British imperial trade, it might have made sense. But yeah, for one country to lean heavily on one industrial project is yeah, a recipe for trouble. 
presumably they were getting a huge amount of other goods imported from the British Empire at mm. this time, because he's the Prime Minister and they haven't declared independence yet. So, and that, well, uh, that was the that was the reason for a lot of British colonies, wasn't it? It was it was you know like establishing fairly small posts to to gather one resource and to trade them in a either a free trade system or later some, a somewhat protected imperial well, trade system, but you know. Well, I mean, this is what I when I, when I went on Lotus Eaters and talked to Dan on the Brokenomic show. This is what I talked about, which was the, um, you know, the the whole Ricardo doctrine of mm. uh, the law of comparative advantage or the law of comparative cost, or Mises calls it the law of association. Um, it actually was an imperial justification for keeping places like Ghana and could say island any part of the empire really um super specialized in one good but of course if they're specialized in that one good they're then reliant on the empire for all other goods right so they they export that one thing for a cheaper cost that they've specialized in but they have to Im they have to import everything else and of course their sole provider for that is britain so it was a, uh, you know, it, it, they called it free trade and laissez-faire, but from another point of view, it 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 is actually a kind of tool of control as well. Hmm. Yeah, I think Ricardo was, he, he, yeah, he was, he was sort of that the, the, the comparative um, was it competitive advantage? Um, it was it was supposed to be a riposte yeah. to certain arguments against the free trade system, and he was saying that, well. I could go on for ages. <laughs> Let's move on, yeah. Showing films to audiences large and small, wherever they could find them. Showing how great rivers can create prosperity for the people who live beside them. The exhibition was a great success, and it helped Nkrumah consolidate his political position. So, sorry to keep on pausing it, but in the, in the case of Ghana in particular, and I did talk about this on Lotus Eaters, it was coca. That is, you know, chocolate. Mm -hmm. um, and basically what they did is all of the arable land was given over to growing chocolate, right? Well, if all of your fields are growing chocolate, they're not growing rice, they're not growing wheat, they're not growing. So you have to import all of that stuff. So, yeah. you know, you, the, basically it's the conversion of all. And you, you can see an, another extreme example of it in Ireland with the, with the potatoes. Well, and everybody knows what happens with the potato famine. Um, I've, now it works if your unit of analysis is the entire British Empire, right? It doesn't. It may not necessarily work if your unit of analysis is just Ghana itself, because <laughs> no nobody would go like if you weren't running it for the benefit of the empire. Nobody running Ghana would run it just on, you know, plant shitloads of cocoa. If, uh, if that's yeah. if that's your if that's mainly what you're producing, you must import food then, and therefore you're reliant yeah. on food imports. Yeah, so that's hazardous. Or it, well, I mean, it means you rely then on peace, uh, and it's, and and Ghana does not have a great deal of diplomatic weight to ensure peace. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. But to his opponents, whom he had defeated in the election, the Volta scheme was a dangerous trap just another cycle in the British exploitation of their country. The British people were anxious to give us that scheme. And one thing I must make clear, the scheme was not started by Nkrumah. The Volta River scheme was an old scheme of a British government. In 1953, Nkrumah's opponents forced a debate in Parliament. In a series of speeches, the opposition MPs warned that Nkrumah was in danger of enslaving the country to powerful interests far beyond his control. As a long-term scheme, it is excellent. But as a short-term scheme, Mr. Speaker, it is suicidal. I would say that no nation which is beginning to free itself puts its neck in a position in which it will find itself in economic slavery. At the end of the debate, Nkrumah defended his partnership with the British. We are not boys, he said. Do you think I am a fool to enter into a project like this blindly? 
I am not so damn silly as to put my nose into something that is detrimental to this country. All my life, I've been a man of peace, working for peace, striving for peace, negotiating for peace. But I'm utterly convinced that the action we have taken is right. In 1956, Britain invaded Egypt to prevent President Nasser from nationalizing the Suez Canal. Within 10 days, the United Nations and the Americans forced them to retreat. Suez symbolized the decline of Britain's colonial power. Vast projects like the Volta Dam began to look increasingly insecure in the face of confident new African leaders. And Britain was running out of money. That same year, Nkrumah's government was told the Volta scheme was shelved. Nkrumah had received the news that the British government uh, intended to pull out of the scheme because uh, the finances were getting too large for them to handle. He, he was... Uh almost in despair, everybody was depressed. All of those of us who were involved in it in any way were shattered when we discovered that the project was on the shelf. Uh, and in Krumah, but in Krumah was not a man to allow depression to take over. This is, this is something I've talked about before, Horace, is the, the empires are expensive and it's always about cost. You know, a lot of um, the analysis these days from the left always talks about how exploitative the British Empire was and how much money it made. But, I mean, you can see here, who? it's obviously a cost, right? My goodness, yeah. And like, well, the, the, the story of the, of the decline of the British Empire, which I think is pretty abrupt, was mainly a financial squeeze. We just, like, the, suddenly at the end of the Second like, during the Second World War in alliance with the U.S., it was the US made it possible for Britain to finance this absurd overspending that Churchill committed to in the you know in the, from forty onwards, and then right at the end of the war they said right that all stops almost immediately, and obviously yeah. Keynes had to go over and negotiate this loan, and it, the, just the next sort of twenty years is just that playing out. It's like Britain just suddenly had nowhere near enough money to sustain all these colonies. And yeah, loads of them were at a cost. Or they were, you know, the state and thereby the taxpayer subsidising certain businesses. Yeah, and I, I've got a really interesting book here uh, all about, it's called Exporting the American Model uh, by, uh, I think it's a French female economist called Jellick, oh uh, right? But what the whole, it was written in the 90s, what the whole book is about really is how martial aid coming into Europe and into Britain had all these little weird strings attached to it that nobody thinks about. Like, for example, they'd say, oh, we're going to send over some um, developmental aid kind of advisors. But really, they were uh, various business studies professors and so on mm. who basically... Uh, said, well, now you have to run business in this way and in that way. And they basically Americanized all of the practices of Europe um, using martial aid and the strings attached to martial aid as the control mechanism. So it's a very cunning scheme that nobody really really thinks about. Uh, that that the Americans fits did with, that. Yeah, that makes sense because uh, I studied the Marshall Plan a little bit um, in the last sort of year or so. Um, and it was basically written, some of it actually before the Second World War, uh, they already had this idea somewhat by the Council on Foreign Relations, right? The Council on Foreign Relations was used by the American, well, by the State Department especially, to craft policy uh, because their expertise was actually better than that of the State Department, I think. But the, the CFR was set up by corporate interests, Morgan, Rockefeller especially. Mm -hmm. uh, Rockefeller took it over as the Morgan sort of declined, but... Those two interests, and the Kunlo company, Lazard Brothers, you know, major financial interests, industrial interests. And it just makes sense, right? I mean, it was it was a body to <laughs> for the benefit of these already very rich, powerful men. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 one of the fascinating things, and I may do a, a separate stream on this one day, is uh, that, that comes out of that book, is that the Americans were very concerned with old European cartels. Yeah, uh, yeah. closing them and, out. Yeah, and, and they 
they basically wanted to make sure that they were broken up or they were anti-trusted or whatever. But then, essentially, the model they export is American multinational conglomerate corporations, right? So yes. they, they, they essentially replace the old cartels with a new set of monopoly corporations, just American-style ones as, as opposed to old kind of European guild style ones, essentially. So Mate, we, we could do a whole stream on this, honestly. Jean Monnet <laughs> was essentially working with <laughs> Jean Monnet, the, the sort of driving figure above everyone else of the, the EU, what became the EU, certainly the common market before that. Uh, he just worked directly with all these people. He was a Rockefeller guy, basically. Uh, <laughs> and um, the common market, that was an explicit aim, break up old European cartels. You cannot have that. So when they founded the EC, you know, the European coal and steel community, in, uh, the first element of the common market and of the EU, uh, that was an explicit demand of the Americans involved. It must not become a European cartel. Uh, it has to be um, open to, well, to, to basically uh, move towards globalism. And um, loads of the same guys, especially George Ball, who was a close friend. He was, a, again, a CFR Rockefeller guy and a close friend of Jean Monnet. By the 60s, late 60s, he was already, he was calling himself one of the new globalists. And globalism meant tearing open all, any sort of cartel, obviously, especially in Europe, because Europe was very rich pickings uh, mm -hmm. for, you know, American investment and so on. Uh, and, yeah, it's all about ending old European cartels, yeah. But, but yeah, if you look at the European economy, it's like Unilever, Procter & Gamble, Nestle, you know, all these just massive companies that, uh, you know, it, I mean, if you work it out, uh, I can't remember the stat now, but it's something like every, every, nut, every out of every tenner that everybody spends, let's say, eight pounds of them goes to the same like group of companies basically right. um especially you know, in consumer products yeah mm -hmm. so so there it is Any, anyway let's get back to ghana uh but this is all happening at the exact same time as this as the yeah as the breakup of the european cartels that we're talking about is also at the same time the breakup of the european empires by the and, the, and, and the fusing of the european economy with america's as well yeah yeah on the 6th of March 1957, the Gold Coast became Ghana, the first black African country to be free. Ghana, your beloved country, is free forever. We are going to demonstrate to the world, to the other nations, young as we are, that we are prepared to lay our own foundation. Out of the darkness, the pledge and the promise. The promise of independence was not just going to be just freedom, but that people will see it in their lives. The promise that we are going to industrialize the country as a means of generating growth, economic growth. And industrialization means... But, sorry to interrupt her again, Horace, but I noticed that the building they made looks very American there. It was like the, the idea, whether they were conscious of it or not, the iconography and the, the kind of slogans sound American to my ear, and they look American. Which makes looks like sense. What... Sorry, sorry, go on. Well, well, I mean, it looks like Washington. It looks like they're trying to rebuild Washington or something in Ghana. Yeah. And, of course, what is American soft power doing at this time and had been doing for some probably a couple of decades before? It was denouncing imperialism, by which we mainly mean British, the British Empire, also the French and the Dutch and so on, and because that was America's way to take over the world's markets, right? Yeah. <laughs> so to get rid of all imperial protection and by basically getting rid of the empires themselves, these guys were subject to that propaganda. Uh, and, yeah. and a lot of them swallowed it. Well, what's fascinating as well, um, I'm not sure about in the case of Ghana, but in the case of uh, lots of parts of Africa, is that in many cases, the uh, Americans were joined by the Soviet Union in this anti-imperial, yeah. anti-colonial project where sometimes they even work together against the Europeans, which is yeah, bizarre. Yeah. Oh, that, that, I mean, yeah, Yalta Conference, there's, that's symbolic of that. It's like Roosevelt and, 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 Star, and, Roosevelt and Stalin laughing at Churchill, you know. <laughs> 
that we must have power. And therefore, the first thing was that all of us should harness all our resources to get in the power established. <laughs> It was a glorious moment for Ghana and for Nkrumah. But in private, he knew that many of the promises on which he had been swept to power might prove dangerously hollow if the dam were not built. It was the key to his vision of leading Africa into a shining tomorrow. Freedom! 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 But then, 4,000 miles away, a simple twist of fate brought the Volta scheme back to life. Sorry, pause one second. Go on. I, I just think Mel Gibson delivered that line better than Kwame and Krumah. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> also, that was a very, very classic Curtis segue, wasn't it? But then, oh. mm. 4,000 miles away. <laughs> very, uh, very classic Curtis. <laughs> At the end of 1957, Nkrumah's finance minister, Komla Bedema, went to America on a private visit. I was invited to Maryland State College to give a talk on the newly independent Ghana. And as I was driving there from New York, I felt like having a drink of orange juice or, some, or water at a roadside restaurant, Howard Johnson's restaurant in Delaware. My secretary, who was an American, a black American told me, Minister, I think this is one of the states where they are very sticky about color. I said, what? The home of good, good food is Howard Johnson's. Howard Johnson's is such a friendly place to have good food. I asked for two glasses of orange Howard juice. Johnson's. The girl looked at us, said, no, sir, you can't. I said, what? You can't. Then she turned away went in and told the manager to come and speak to us. So the manager came and said, gentlemen, I'm sorry, because of your color, you can't drink in here. And I said to him, look, there are people here who are lower social status than I am, but they can drink and I can't. Okay, you can keep the orange juice and the change, but you haven't heard the last of this. Next morning, it was world news. Oh my God, have we not heard the last of it? Bloody I hell. Mean, this, this is symbolic. <laughs> this is, um, I like the fact that he left the tip, by the way. <laughs> he left the change. But um, yeah, this is symbolic, obviously. This is, uh, this is obviously a, a decolonial sort of uh, upstart Marxist regime bonding with the US presidency on progressive values, right? On anti racism. Mm -hmm. All over the world. Well, during like the course of breakfast, the president he he wanted to know how it all happened. So I told him. During breakfast, he asked me, "What were you doing in the United States?" I said, "I have come here to talk about the Volta project." How's that project? He asked. Say, "Well, we put it in cold storage because we can't find the money immediately." Have you talked to the State Department? He said, "No, we haven't." Dick. Richard, will you take care of that? And that was how the Volta project came back to life so soon. People forget that Nixon was the was the VP for for uh, Dwight there, wasn't he? For Eisenhower, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so and then he and then he was frozen out of politics for a little while, and then he came back. It's all in the movie. It's back in '68, yeah. Back yeah. in '68, yeah. And Krumer seized the opportunity. He wrote to Eisenhower asking for help in building the dam. Eisenhower invited him to visit America. At their meeting in March 1958, he told Nkrumah that the best way to get the scheme started again would be to involve American industry. The Kaiser Aluminum Hour. Eisenhower contacted Edgar Kaiser. He was head of one of the largest aluminium corporations in the world. Kaiser Aluminum, the bright star of metal. Kaiser was based in Oakland, California. So do you think the Africans are thinking, shit, out of the frying pan into the fire? Oh, we have no. to deal with the bloody Americans now. I, <laughs> and it's not... I really, I really, I really believe they're excited by this. I, I really think they see America as progressive and new and friendly to their interests. Um, right. That's not what I if I if I was him, I'd be thinking maybe we could maybe we could tr trust the British more. 
uh, on the projects there. I mean, who would you trust? The nice old British Empire or Kaiser Aluminum? <laughs> I'd really, I would really emphasise how that by this point they've already probably had decades of of propaganda coming out of America against the British Empire, uh, mm-hmm. and it was very effective. It's done with a big smile. It's done like with a, you know words of compassion uh, and respect for all peoples. And the Atlantic Charter, obviously, which uh, Churchill signed up to um, in what 1940 or whatever it was, um, which was you know which was when Churchill agreed to dismantle the empire. Um, but that thinking was already well in place in the US regime by the start of the Second World War. And this is, what, 15 or 18 years after. Yeah, um, I mean, even uh, even Woodrow Wilson was big on it. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, so. yeah. And these ideas suited American capital. I don't know how, how you know, but whether, whether or not they were truly held as well, some of these people really were progressives, but it just suited your your Rockefellers especially and your globalist minded capitalists. Yeah, break apart the old powers for yeah. you know in the interests of uh, the new ones. It had mines and smelting plants throughout the world. It promoted aluminium as the shining lightweight metal of the future. Presenting aluminum in a demonstration of those remarkable properties that have made it the favorite of millions. Aluminum is famed for its lightness. At Eisenhower's request, Edgar Kaiser flew from California to meet Nkrumah in New York. We were staying at the Waldorf Towers, and Edgar came in, and he and Nkrumah stood and looked at each other, and some kind of magnetic quality passed between them. Uh, It was quite remarkable. They took to each other at once. And I doubt if that um, electricity ever evaporated throughout their experience, although they had many uh, set twos in one way or another. Today, Ghana is a land of the future. Accra's international airport serves the major airlines. At the end of 1958, a team of Kaiser executives and engineers flew to Accra to look at the plans for the scheme. And at the end of the journey, a modern city. Welcoming Krumer offered the Kaiser team a deal. If they agreed to build an aluminium smelter in Ghana, then his government would be able to raise the money for the dam. In return, the dam would supply the large quantities of electricity needed by the plant. The rest would go... Just realised that I'm drinking from an aluminium can here as well. I'm looking at the... It says I can recycle it. That probably means it is aluminium, right? The cartoon, well, well, it used that when we were kids. That was the case, but you can recycle other metals now as well. But the uh, the cartoon said aluminium is the favourite of millions. Have you got a favourite metal? <laughs> <laughs> uh, gold. I don't know. Uh. <laughs> I like bauxite, but I don't like aluminium. I don't know why. I just you know, <laughs> it's just never done it for me. Lead. Uh, I don't know. Lead's, lead's all right. Yeah. That's, no complaints about it. <laughs> to power the future industries of the new Ghana. To the Kaiser team, Ghana seemed an attractive prospect. It was wealthy. I think they had $400 million in the bank. Very highly educated. Uh, everyone, every driver was reading the newspaper. I mean, they, they were very literate people. And, uh, and it, it was a good, as good a place to try in Africa as you could go to. They were aggressive. Uh, there was one young lawyer who impressed me, who became great friends, Ron Sullivan. He was very aggressive, and uh, they were... Uh, later on got to understand what they were, they were, they were doing. That, that, that was their nature. Unlike the British, who were very gentlemanly. The, the Americans were straight to the point, and um, no frills or wrapping up the... They call a spade a spade and Whoa. a shovel a shovel. <laughs> what do you think of that assessment? Careful, <laughs> careful. <laughs> they wanted the dam. And we were the means to get it because we were the way that the dam was being financed. 40 seconds. Is it always- I just, oh, just right then, I just imagine Beavis going, is this a goddamn... 
<laughs> uh. It's been assumed by the Ghanaians that, as with the British scheme, the I mean, is anyone going to make the joke? They were damned if they did and damned if they don't. <laughs> it works. It works perfectly. The smelter would use the vast reserves at their own bauxite and so create an important new industry. But in the middle of the negotiations, the Kaiser team made it clear they had no intention of using Ghana's bauxite for the time being. Instead, they would import the raw materials needed by the smelter from America. The decision... Sh what? Yeah, that rings, that rings familiar, doesn't it? Um... They were going to they were, they were go to all the trouble to build the stuff there and then import <laughs> the raw materials from the States. <laughs> Metal. So, so yeah, you, you know, what you said about strings attached, that, that does seem to be... You know, in the construction of what we now call the American Empire, that that was their method, really, of hooking them in. My gosh! Shocked the Ghanaian negotiating team. They might have been disappointed, but you have to realize that wasn't that high grade of bauxite. It was uh, <clears throat> high thirties or um, or low forties, and the bauxite, for example, over in in uh, Guinea was fifty five percent makes a lot of difference in cost. We just, it just wasn't possible at that time. This seemed to be totally wrong to Nkrumah. He was intensely upset. He could never believe that Ghana's bauxite couldn't be converted by a series of processes into pots and pans and roofing sheets. Pause a second. What the Kaiser executive... Go on. Do you remember the, have you seen, uh, the, is it the Borat movie where he goes, uh, he sings a song about Kazakhstan's supremacy in potassium. Yes, All other yeah. nations have inferior potassium. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, the, I can see why it's got. It, I can see why it's got him for him though. I mean, what's the point? You get you. You know, you make all these deals. That now you're not even going to use the bauxite that you've got. You're going to import it from Guinea. I mean, so, come on. Yeah, and he plows on anyway didn't tell the Ghanaians was that there was another reason why they didn't want to use the local bauxite. We were greatly concerned that if we located within Ghana all of the bauxite and power necessary to have an integrated aluminum operation, that someday our project, if it were profitable, might be nationalized by the government. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. I forgot that bit. Yeah. Mm. I mean, that had happened, what, five years before with the Anglo Persian Oil Company? Yes. Yeah, it did happen there. Mm. And taken away from us. The Kaiser team refused to change their minds. They knew, as well as Nkrumah did, that without them, there would be no dam. At the end of 1959, Nkrumah told his team to agree to Kaiser's terms. Millions of dollars worth of Ghanaian bauxite would remain in the ground. But with Kaiser's letter of intent in his pocket... See, deal with these American lawyers and they're just going to fuck you over, basically. That's what I'm learning here. I mean, the guy was implying a minute ago that, yeah, that when he said the British are very gentlemanly, you know, he means, like, snide, right? But uh, <laughs> <laughs> what you find is the Americans are blunt and then it turns out there's more conditions later, you know. <laughs> so. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, honestly, I have so many of these books here... Uh, and all of them are just stock full of American fuckery, basically. And that's all stuff like this over and over and over again. Do you ever watch well, Succession? I haven't. I haven't seen that one, no. Bro, bro, uh, what's his name? Brian Cox is... Is it Brian Cox, the Scottish guy? No. Is that his name? I've forgotten. The, the, the old Scottish guy, the, the main character. There's a bit in that where he makes a deal. He's a media. He's a, like a yeah, media guy, broadcasting papers and stuff. And it's just at one point he makes a deal with a bunch of guys and then he just before he fully shakes on it he goes in the room with his advisors and he goes why are they smiling and it's like he's made a deal that he's happy with but the fact they're happy just unsettles him so he's just like right grind another few percent out of them <laughs> be, and you do it and be horrible it's just you know it's like in this that that seems to be the environment in, in american business it's just as ruthless yeah. as can be you know yeah i mean i'm not the, the thing is is that Okay, yes, the British had their ruthless side as well. Yeah. But my my impression reading stuff is that there was actually 
more handshake deals and people honoring their words and all this sort of stuff. Um, and you can even see it in some of the naivety of Churchill, where he just believed that the Americans would like give him a decent deal because they were mates or whatever. And of course, you know, it doesn't work like that. Don't get me started. Move on. <laughs> the crewman knew he could now set about raising the money to build the dam. He approached the World Bank. Oui. It had been set up at the end of the war to provide loans to rebuild Europe, but now it had turned its attention to the third world. He asked the bank for 30 million pounds. It was the largest loan ever requested. Yet the bank's sorry. economists believed, as Nkrumah did... Go on, Horace, sorry. Just wanted to say about the World Bank, for anyone who doesn't know, it is controlled by virtually the exact same people as the Council on Foreign Relations and just all the businesses I mentioned earlier, especially Rockefeller guys. I mean, literally the same list of people control all these things. Um, yeah. So yeah. you just cycle through. And I um, I also learned that the, the, you know, the Vietnam guy, Robert McNamara, hmm. he ends up be becoming the president of the World Bank, Bank in 68. And he was in that role all the way up until the 80s, I think. Right. So, uh, yeah, Robert McNamara, rare, a rare person who gets like two major villain runs in his, in his. Yeah, he was, he was obviously a Ford guy, wasn't he? Um, before, before politics. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was like a exec. Um, yeah, I think he was like outstandingly effective at Ford, and therefore was selected. Well, it, yeah, he was just so he was so admired as a as a chief exec that they thought he'd be a good politician. Yeah, work on that. <laughs> um, that is a story in itself, though, because um, he was part of the process whereby Ford went from being, um, you know, the personal fiefdom of Henry Ford, mm. a kind of executive entrepreneurial company, to being a managerial company uh -huh. in the James Burnham sense. And, you know, the fact that they were hiring a man like McNamara was part of that whole process that made Ford basically almost like an arm of the American state by that point, rather than this independent empire that a man like Henry Ford had. Um, so that's another, I mean, I think I talk about that somewhere in Populist Illusion, but it's just uh, an interesting aside, I suppose. But, uh, yeah. Electricity was the key to industrial development in the third world. We envisage the development of this power resource as fundamental to Ghanaian economic development. The provision of power, electric power to Ghana, was an immense economic benefit to the country, was a sin qua non of economic development in the country. So let's accept that the economic benefits for power to Ghana were tremendous. The belief that science and technology applied on a grand scale would somehow inevitably propel a third world country into the industrial age was the prevailing wisdom of the time. It was called the theory of takeoff. It gripped the imagination of politicians and economists, both in the West and in the third world. Uh, pause a second, sorry. In um, Go I, on. I think the theory of takeoff came, from, I, I may be mistaken, but I think it came from Eugene Rostow or Walt Rostow, the, the Rostow brothers. Uh, and they were in exactly the same circles, you know, Council on Foreign Relations and so on mm -hmm. and so on. I am seeing one fatal flaw in their plan as it pertains to Ghana, but you know, you can use your imagination as to what that <laughs> might be. <laughs> June 1960, the World Bank approved the scheme in principle, but its report had important reservations. The most serious concerned the price Kaiser paid Ghana for electricity. The World Bank made it clear that if Nkrumah was to get the benefits he expected from the dam, he must negotiate a certain minimum rate for the power. If he didn't, Ghana might find it difficult to take off. Our report essentially was saying to Ghana, this project will succeed and we're prepared to make a loan on it and the loan can be paid out uh, if the power price is right. This was absolutely the key to the negotiations. As a conductor of electricity, it's hard to beat. But Kaiser needed a low rate if the smelter was to be profitable. A second round of negotiations began. In toughness and adaptability, it can be made as strong as structural steel. Nkrumah faced a terrible dilemma. His advisers and the World Bank told him that if he accepted the price Kaiser was offering, the high expectations he had of the dam might not be realized. 
But if he refused, Nkrumah knew that Kaiser would pull out and the dam would never be built. Nkrumah was a man besieged. He had to do something. As you know, he... I mean, he's been well and properly fucked, is the way I'm seeing it. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know... That theory of takeoff, that, I mean, that was there to suit the business interests involved. I mean, it's not necessarily a serious theory. And he wasn't going to be able to fill, fulfill the theory, even as intended anyway, so... Mm -hmm. I, I will also say that that whole sequence was very the images of the of the contracts and the kind of the the women at the typewriters and so on was very classic Adam Curtis as well, mm -hmm. very classically Curtis uh, sequence. For hopes of the development of the country, that the Volta River project would turn uh, Ghana into a modern industrial country. He had no other program. In so far as he saw it as providing this minimum of the power which he saw, he was prepared to go along. The negotiations dragged on through the autumn of 1960. Neither side would give way on the electricity price. Finally, one hot afternoon in December, Edgar Kaiser decided to confront Nkrumah and force the issue. Kaiser asked for the meeting to be adjourned and went straight to Nkrumah and explained um, that perhaps his shareholders would not go along with the project if we asked for a higher power rate than Kaiser was asking for. A message came back after lunch, direct from Nkrumah, that we were to go ahead and, and accept the rate. He wanted the project at all costs. Kwame Nkrumah and Edgar Kaiser on the 22nd of January 1962 signed the master agreement which enfolded every provision that was necessary between Edgar Kaiser's company and the Ghana government. Pause a second. When they had signed it... Oh, sorry, just recalling what he said a second ago. Um, he wanted the project at all costs. I'm sure that was obvious to the American businessman. You let people know that, uh, you're in their pocket. They, 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 they can negotiate very hard. Uh, yeah, they, you're almost certainly not going to walk away. Uh, also, look at, it, look at his look at it from his point of view as well, though. Right, he's already lost the aluminium part of the deal that he wanted because mm. mm. you know they reckon they can't make the bauxite or whatever. Yeah, they came up with. Now he's going to lose the, the damn part of it as well. I mean, that's it. That's his whole project is done. You know. Yeah, it's, it's like what Theresa May did when she started the Brexit negotiations, just told the enemy, told the other side what her position, what her final position was. And yeah. it's like, well, then they just don't have to negotiate. <laughs> it's, yeah, schoolboy school arrows all round. Mm -hmm. And he's in there with absolute sharks here, absolute yeah. sharks. And he's, he's naive, and he's a Marxist, so he's not going to understand capitalism. He's going to think he does, but he doesn't. <laughs> so, it's a disaster. They stood up and clasped each other in a very, very genuine embrace. I was there uh, together with a large number of other uh, distinguished guests, and we, I don't think any of us will ever forget it. The following day, we all went to Akasombo, and Nkrumah let off a vast charge, and the steam started. <laughs> Yes, I suppose you can say Kaiser used Nkrumah. But if that makes Nkrumah passive, that would be inaccurate. Because Nkrumah also used Kaiser. The question is, whose end of the bargain came out better? Nkrumah would seem to have been going into an area with so many unknowns. One can say that while he was pursuing power, power slipped through his fingers. But even as Nkrumah and Edgar Kaiser celebrated, other forces were becoming involved in the scheme. The dam was now a hostage in the vicious confrontations of the Cold War. A year before, the Congo had been torn apart by a brutal civil war. America and the Soviet Union backed opposite sides. The policy of the new Kennedy administration was to fight the spread of communism in Africa. In 1960, Brezhnev, the president of the Soviet Union, had visited Ghana. It frightened America's leaders. They were determined that Nkrumah, despite his brand of African socialism, would be their man. 
Cromwell was everything. He was everything, politically, economically, uh, psychologically, uh, culturally, and so on. He, he, he just absolutely dominated the scene. Nkrumah, though, wanted to keep Ghana and Africa out of the Cold War. President and distant delegates. Can I just say, Horace, I've mentioned this before, but in the original conception of the first world, second world, third world, the course that he is trying to carve here of staying neutral was the original meaning of what third world meant. Um, and first world meant you were aligned with the US, second world meant you were aligned with the Soviet Union, third world was the studied neutrality uh, pursued by India during this time, and any other country that tried to do this. So and that would have made Ghana third world in this world order. Right. I learned that from a Kit Kat packet, actually. It was, yeah, the second world was the communist bloc. But yeah, yeah. this so there was a non-aligned movement launched in, I think, the early 60s or something. It was with Yugoslavia, India, Indonesia, other countries like that. Generally yeah. left-leaning, generally like socialist-leaning. Um, India was, yeah. was very friendly to the Soviets, but, but non, not under their aegis. Yeah, non-Soviet generally leftist they were um and there are all sorts of weird kinks in that like so for example iran and iraq and turkey when they were u.s aligned were considered first world countries right, right. right? but then you know when they switch then they then they become second or third depending on who they're aligned with uh whereas now i think the word the, the phrase third world is generally just used to refer to anywhere that seems like a bit of a shithole, basically, which is not they replaced. They re yeah, they replaced it with the term developing countries, didn't they? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's quite clear that a desperate attempt is being made to create confusion in the Congo, extend the Cold War to Africa, and involve Africa in the suicidal quarrels of foreign powers. The United Nations must not allow this to happen. But there was the dam. The American government realised that it was a powerful weapon with which to ensnare Nkrumah. Like the World Bank, the Kennedy administration had agreed to lend millions of dollars to the scheme. In an internal memorandum, the Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, made it quite clear what this money was for. By maintaining this leverage on Nkrumah, he wrote, the US will be in a better position to influence his policies. In public, though, it was called foreign aid. The problem was that we foresaw that the, the progress that the Soviets were making and extending their communist ideology, uh, particularly in Africa and... Can I just say this guy, George Ball, has been in other documentaries as well. He was in, uh, I'm pretty sure he was in an Ocean Apart, and I'm, I'm fairly sure he's been in previous episodes of this as well. He, he's obviously... He... Uh, sorry, he 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 closed. Like, I mean, I mentioned him earlier. He he nurtured John Monet, perhaps more than anyone else, the yeah the founder of the, the driving force of the EU. Jean Monet, uh, sorry, George Ball somehow had a meeting with I think Jean Monet and Edward Heath not long before Heath decided to unilaterally put us into the common market, mm -hmm. um, and he said he couldn't believe like he he went in there hoping that they could convinced Britain to do it and he said Edward Heath was, al was already ready but this guy is an arch globalist and like the EU was um something he drove forward at every opportunity he could because he saw it as part of a globalist vision and basically American domination of Europe as well yeah he, a very influential figure he's he's all over that book I've got exporting the American model as well just a key figure along with Monet as you as you, as you mentioned mm. and Kuhn Loeb Investment Bank who were allied with the Rockefellers as well some extent in South America, certainly in the Middle East, and that uh, therefore we had to counter that some way, and we countered it with with foreign aid as as a as a defense against the spread of communism. Bit by bit, and Krumer's utopian vision was slipping away. The Volta scheme had become something very different from what he had originally intended. At every stage, the project had been shaped not by his idealism, but by powerful political and economic pressures. But Nkrumah still believed it was worthwhile, because once the dam was built, it could not be taken away. In time, it would become the engine of his country's future. 
Um, and how, how much, maybe you don't know this, but how much electricity is this dam meant to generate? I mean, he's putting a lot into it. I think when I watched it before, I assumed he meant to like even export energy. Uh, maybe. I'm not sure. But um, I mean, are not... dams really that good at generating electricity then? Are they? You know, <laughs> not, that I've, not that I've heard of. Not that I, I, I really don't know, actually. But um, I mean, I've heard that the, the Hoover Dam, the, the, I think it's previously called the, the Boulder Dam, um, mm-hmm. that was under the Tennessee Valley Authority. That was purely a, an economic stimulus thing in the Great Depression. That was not, <laughs> was not supposed to be economic. It was supposed to just, as they say, put money into the economy, that Keynesian term. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I do understand the importance of infrastructure. You know, that, that bridge was knocked, was knocked down in Baltimore the other day, and they were talking about how much money it's going to cost. There is something to be said for the value of actually just having it. It exists now, and therefore, you know, it's being, therefore, you know, it's the it's the other side of the opportunity cost stuff that uh, William Hazlitt talks about. You know, mm-hmm. um, so there is something to be said for building infrastructure, but I, I do have to I do have to wonder about what the total output of this dam is. is is going to be once it's built. It's something um, Curtis never Curtis never never gets into numbers, does he? Uh, he, he I mean, I doubt Curtis understands economics. Um, no, right. <laughs> yeah, it's hopeful. Those absolutely were optimistic times for hope. Ghana was singular in the sense that it had everything. It had educated people. Uh, it had considerable infrastructure, three universities, schools lawyers, doctors, it it had everything going for it. The construction of the dam was to take four years. Throughout Ghana, factories and roads began to be built, the foundations of the industrial revolution that would be powered by the dam. But with these trappings of the modern world came other forces that took Ghana's fragile economy even further from Nkrumah's control. Corruption is not a problem peculiar to any country. I personally feel that the only way in which you can stop corruption in the country is to build up a strong public opinion against it. Elements edited. I mean, I've got other ideas on that personally, but... Uh... That's a strange line, wasn't it? <laughs> Into the equation that had not been adequately foreseen. And perhaps the greatest of them was corruption. Mm. Corruption of government and of government people. And corruption, I call it corruption, on the part of foreign suppliers who uh, tried to sell Ghana, in fact, did sell Ghana, on uh, investment in substantial industrial enterprises which did not, were not properly designed for the country and did not, in fact, achieve uh, success. Sorry, just pause one second. In the- just one thing I would I would adduce in support of uh, this outcome being representative of uh, big state projects is even in Britain, which is a place where corporate governance or you know like project governance is probably among some of the best in the world. Still, there's the examples of the Millennium Dome, the Millennium Stadium in Cardiff, Wembley Stadium, the Olympics, where all of them. It's not just that they, they, they overrun their estimates, i.e. the estimates are false. Um, mm-hmm. It's that they overrun them by like five or ten times uh, in Britain, yeah. right? And that is, that is people stealing, I'm sure. Um, it's, you know, it, it just give a false estimate to win the contract or to get the project past public uh, opinion and then reveal the real cost by just spending. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, it, it, you know. in some, I know for the Millennium Dome, and many other similar projects, one of the massive problems is that it becomes a bit of a gravy train. Yeah. So it's yeah. like, oh, now we need to hire this management consultant. Right. We need this expert. Now we, we need, need that expert. And yeah, we need Jason Lanyard to come in and oversee it all. Yeah. Yeah. And and so and so you end up well, all of those people command massive salaries. And before you know it, you've you've you know spent two, three times the budget. Just on and, consultants, you know. and everyone involved except the taxpayer is having a good time. You know, it's fine, <laughs> and and the media will just present it as a mistake, as an accident, so they get yeah. away with it. And that's in Britain. 
Yes, in in you know, uh, if you have a look at like world corruption charts, Britain's like one of the least corrupt places in theory in the world. Um, I think Ghana's got to be uh, at the other end, right? Yeah, and I also, I mean, I don't know if Curtis is going to go into it, but I'm sure you get the empire of dust problem as well, where you know, even when you even when you deliver the things. Now, like, what what happens when you get the workers on the ground who just don't do it, you know? Mm. They just haven't done, they haven't picked up the poles or, you know, they just left it there. They didn't turn up. You know, all those all those sorts of little things also happen in a place in, in Africa, you know? So. Yeah. In the early 60s, Ghana became a mecca for European industrialists eager to win large contracts from Nkrumah's government. They began to discover that the easiest way was to offer officials from Nkrumah's party a bribe. This soon became the accepted way of doing business in Accra. What resulted was a rush to sell Ghana anything, no matter how inappropriate for an emerging African nation. <laughs> Vast sums of Ghana's precious foreign currency were spent on these projects. Mm -hmm. Then, in 1964, Nkrumah's industrial experiment received another body blow. The world price of cocoa, which had been falling for four years, finally crashed. It was Ghana's main source of foreign exchange. See, there's the there's the problem of the holdover of the British Empire there. What our fella, rather than being obsessed with this dam, should have been doing from the minute they declared independence was diversifying the economy away from cocoa as much as he could have. And uh, as I understand it, this guy, I think actually after these events, he took on more dictatorial powers, but he was obviously, I, mean, I think he was very popular. I think he had like a strong government to work with mm -hmm. to, to some extent. Um, that would give him the breathing room to plan ahead maybe five or ten years. And you've got to expect commodity prices to crash. You've got, that, that just happens like out completely out of your hands. And mm. he just didn't. <laughs> The millions of pounds needed to pay for the new factories began to dry up. Ghana, once one of the richest countries in Africa, began to slide into debt. How many times have we heard this story? It's depressing. Once one of the richest countries in Africa, under the British Empire, now sliding into debt. Show me the river. Take me across. And wash all my troubles away. Nkrumah was an increasingly isolated figure on the world stage. What had once been seen as visionary ideas were now perceived as dangerous megalomania. And his country was sinking ever deeper into debt. Can't you see By 1965. Just, just wanted to point out that that guy is singing what, like a kind of a bluesy or bluegrass song. I mean, that's like American, yeah, it's an American. <laughs> American, American culture seeping in. I think it may be like a Louis Armstrong song, something like that. Right. It had become very desperate, and I remember we decided to write a memorandum to Nkrumah to tell him the truth. No, it was actually a uh, lucky old son, if, if memory serves. Lucky Old Son, Son, which was originally sung by Charles Avenar. If that's going on, I was pretty into music when I was younger, Horace, but uh, I'm pretty sure it's Lucky Old Son, yeah. Which became, what do you call uh, that? Like, like blues or what do you call that? Yeah, it was like basically a blue, like a blue, a folk blue standard hmm. um, that was sung. It became part of what they called the Great American Songbook. So it would have oh. been sung by some of those jazz. You know, like the jazz singers as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it, every, everybody would have that as part of their repertoire. If it's the yeah. song I'm thinking of, Lucky Old Son, yeah. Did, did you ever play Fallout New Vegas? Uh, yeah, I did, actually. Oh, I yeah, did. you talk about Mr. House, don't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, um, I did play it, yeah. Well, Lucky Old Son was the name of a mission in that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure it was written by Charles Avenar originally. Can we but, just have a quick toast to uh, New Vegas? What a game! What a game! It was good. I I did enjoy. I did enjoy. Uh, I never finished it. It was one of those ones where I got so far and then something came up and I never went back to it. You know, 
I probably really had to get my PhD in or something. <laughs> something Any, uh, anyone listening who likes role play, role playing games, that's a, that's an ace of the genre. It's terrific. Yeah, I, I, I mean I, that song, "Lucky Old Son." I'm pretty sure, like everybody from like Frank Sinatra and Andy Williams to like blues singers to folk guys would possibly have that as part of their set at, at some point in the in the 40s it's like it's a little like that sinatra song that's in um blade runner 2049 um one for my baby you know one for her, right it's yeah. that sort of like sort of you can, mm-hmm. similar style state of affairs of the, of the economy i had written that the results were only five hundred thousand pounds he looked at me and said ah you didn't check your the typing, you left a few zeros. Uh, so I said, no, sir, there are no, there are no zeros left. It's 500,000. Can you imagine being the president of a country and the guy saying you've got 500 grand left? <laughs> and they said a few years before they had 400 mil. Yeah. My God. What do we have in the, in the banks overseas? And he sat back. Then what he did was that he went round the table, he went to everyone who was seated, seated there the meeting and asked them, Frimpong says we have 500,000. Is he right? Do you agree with him? And that was the first time the whole cabinet acknowledged to the president that Ghana was bankrupt. A river. Take me across and wash all my troubles away. Like the lucky old son, give me nothing to do. Roll around heaven all day. Our objective is African Union now. There is no time to waste. <laughs> so that was his plan. <laughs> Fuck, we're bankrupt. African Union, anyone? <laughs> I wonder if, is that why Gaddafi arrived at the same position? Gaddafi didn't manage things as badly, did he? I think Libyans actually lived reasonably well. Like, it's the one sort of reasonably successful commodity yeah, I mean, state. Yeah, I mean, one day I would love to look at Gaddafi's Libya on a show because he did all sorts of weird things there, though. He had, like, these people's assemblies and... Um, it's actually like a really radical experiment in what you might call real democracy, um, which, well, I, it, that went about as well as you can imagine. It did, it did centralize a bit more after that. But uh, uh, it's an interesting, the whole Gaddafi show is an interesting thing to look at in totality. In fact, it, he was in power for so long, it would have to be like a two or three parter, probably. But I'd love to do that one day. He's in. He's in one of these uh, Curtis documentaries, isn't he? There's. Uh, he definitely remember. crops up. He definitely crops up a few times. Yeah, uh, hyper normalization. He's in definitely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah he's in yeah. that one. Hmm. We must unite, or we perish. I am confident that by our concerted effort. And determination. Kwame Nkrumah was losing both domestically and, and internationally in his posture. He was practically alone in Flagstaff House. Uh, he was really a little bit paranoid. It was really awfully sad. He was even afraid to... Uh, I remember they opened their parliament one day and uh, Nkrumah didn't want to take the chance to drive from Flagstaff House to, to the parliament building. Uh, uh, he was Sorry. a prisoner in a sense. Uh, po- pause one you know, there- Sorry. I just wanted to say, what, like, um, just I'm curious about one thing that Nkrumah's calling for this African Union now <laughs> in yeah. desperation. Uh, this is what, still late 50s or early 60s, right? That's 65, I mean, 65, 66, uh, something like that. Yeah, right. Um, and I wonder if he's just observing that that's what Britain under Macmillan and then who came after uh, home and Wilson. 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 Yeah, I think it was, it was under Macmillan that we. That, well, yeah, Macmillan applied or sort of asked de Gaulle to let us in twice and was rebuffed both times. Um, but 
it, that was sort of out of desperation as well. It was this this sense of like real crisis, you know, following Suez especially mm -hmm. uh, and various other things going wrong. Suez was a real like psychological hammer blow, it seems. Um, this sense of just we are sinking. I think probably wrongly, but um, yeah, it, it's, it's like for, for Britain, joining the common market was also really quite similar to what, what Nkrumah has done here. Uh, yeah, I wonder no, if he I, was watching because he would have been in touch with uh, people like Macmillan. Did, didn't the IMF come in just before he took us into Europe in the first Britain place? Got a bailout from the IMF, wasn't it? A sort of bailout arrangement sort of thing. That was 75, I think, or 76. Right. That was under Wilson, the second Wilson term. I see. Yeah. What, a, what an absolute shit show. Oh, it's but, but, humiliating. But, but, but also, um, you know, you mentioned Gaddafi. Someone in the chat said that Gaddafi went bankrupt 17 times. Oh, okay. <laughs> so maybe his pan-Africanism was part of this as well. So. I mean, yeah, I shouldn't be surprised. There had been a, a couple of attempts on his life while we were there. So he, he had reason to be a little bit apprehensive. But toward the end, uh, he was a different person. So, sorry, just pause one, one, more, one more minute. Go on. Is, is it like was that like a big sort of like state show and everyone's standing around watching one guy poorly doing backward somersaults? What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> probably probably cost like uh, way too much money as well. You know, everyone was on the take just for that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this uh, the story of this guy is very familiar though. That you know he he was idealistic and popular. But now, by this point, he's become a megalomaniac and paranoid and a bit mm -hmm. tyrannical. And so many of them follow this. Yeah. You know, even even Mugabe in his early days was not the Mugabe of late of late on. You know, no, uh, no. Oh, and uh, Saddam Hussein as well. He was quite popular. For yeah, seventies, seventies, and early eighties. Saddam was popular as well. Yeah. Did you know Varg? Viacern has lived out there when he was young. He lived in Iraq. Did he? Yeah. Count Grishnak lived in Iraq, yeah. Wow. But can I just say, or somebody in the chat is defending the backflips and saying, like, I bet you can't do a backflip. No, I can't. <laughs> no, uh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a picture of my dad doing a, a brilliant back backflip, though. So, you know, it's in, it's in, it's in the family. <laughs> 22nd of January 1966, the dam was finally finished. And Krumer organized a massive celebration. He invited the whole country to attend. The mood of uh, the people at the celebration, the mood of the country was euphoric. There was this vast project which had come in and uh, they understood it would have a tremendous impact and effect on the country. I felt euphoric. I was quite enthusiastic. I thought a new dawn had uh, come for Ghana. But then everything failed. <laughs> Let's see how this goes. <laughs> but all that was happening against a background of a country that already had no money. It, it had exchange controls, import controls. So it was just like a big emperor's new clothes. Nobody could say that Ghana was broke, but Ghana really was broke. President Eisenhower and President Kennedy were genuinely interested in this project because they saw behind the cold figures and the rigid calculations that the Volta River project was not only an economically viable project, but also an opportunity for the United States of America to make a purposeful capital investment in a developing country. You see before you in all his majesty, strength and power, the Akonso Bodar, which has tamed the turbulent waters of the Volta. A lot of us, myself particularly, you know, did not take, uh, did not take our seats uh, at the official uh, seating place 
and watch the ceremony from uh, further um, uphill. Um, uh, many, many reasons for that. Uh, one of them was that there was talk of a possible coup at the time. This is Ghana's Volta River project. That engineer, was he black then? Or because he didn't, ethnic, ethnically, I wasn't sure where he was from. Didn't I look don't look like... at his name. What did, he, did his name look Ghana? Uh, Louis mm. Casely Hayford. But if I was to guess, he doesn't look he doesn't look Ghanaian. Could be he, could be from America, could be like half. Or he could half. be half, could be half or something like that. But yeah, maybe. I, I reckon or he's Egyptian or something like that. He, or, or, yeah. or or Arabic or something. Louis Caselli. Caselli could be Hungarian, I suppose. Like Caselli. Yeah, it's hard to say, but I I couldn't help but notice that as well. Because he's the only like proper engineer that we've seen so far did not take uh, did not take our seats uh, at the official uh, seating place and watch the ceremony from uh, further um, uphill um, uh, many many reasons for that uh, one of them was that there was talk of possible coup at the time this is Ghana's Volta River project a project that is to lead Ghana to a new, brighter, and a more prosperous future. Citizens of Ghana and fellow countrymen, good evening. The Ghana Armed Forces took over the reins of government of this country after a successful overthrow of the regime of Kwame Nkrumah. In Shit, so there was a coup. One month after the dam was ready. <laughs> so fucking tra the tragedy of this guy, just obsessed with this dam. And now it's finally made, he's overthrown. <laughs> and they had 400 mil in the bank. Bankrupt. Bankrupt just because he put all his chips in this damn project. <laughs> do you think he just like, stayed up dreaming all night about what this dam was going to do? And then now it's fine. I mean, it's a really tragic kind of uh, hmm. almost like kind of a Ozzy Mandiaz type thing, or you know, what do you call it? Like an albatross, like a millstone, like a great project that's never properly finished, you know, well, like uh, chasing a mirage. Yeah, they um. They, they they had something to work with. They had considerable resources for a third world country. And yeah, and, and a decently educated population, according to that American dude. So, yeah. yeah. Although that was Who bullshit, really obviously. Described <laughs> as one of the boldest ventures in the history of this country. Hello, fans. <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse the bristling about with weapons and the flushing in the face, but I've just come from dashing away from it, doing a bit of liberating. <laughs> and overthrowing the government and all that business. Overthrowing the government is rather heavy going at the best of times, but my goodness, folks, this, this is a landmine in the history of Africa, no mistake. The military coup won enormous popular support, and Krumah had failed to deliver the modern Ghana he had promised. The dam had come too late to save him. But there were other forces involved in planning the coup. America, too, had finally lost patience with Nkrumah. Oh, here we go, the Americans. <laughs> All right, so this, he's a CIA guy. That's John Stockwell, he's CIA. <laughs> Ridiculous. It's so typical every single time. Oh, the Americans. Yeah. <laughs> Because I'm guessing they still had a stake, right? Um, <laughs> they got a big stake in it, and they want to get some fucking money. Yeah, back, right? yeah. <laughs> Howard Bain, who was the CIA station chief in Accra, uh, engineered the overthrow of Kwame Nkrumah. Now, obviously, you can look at it different ways. Uh, a Ghanaian might say, I thought we did it. Inside the CIA, though, it was quite clear Howard Bain got a double promotion and the intelligence star for having overthrown Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana. The magic of it, what made it so exciting to the CIA, 
was that Howard Bain had had enough imagination and drive to run the operation without ever documenting what he was doing. The only thing he's missing, Horace, is the Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> 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 the order of the former spooks have, you know. <laughs> <DL>. <laughs> <laughs> and to sweep along his bosses in such a way they knew what he was doing, tacitly they approved, but there wasn't one shred of paper that he generated that would nail the CI hierarchy as being responsible. And crewmen fled job. to Guinea and never returned. I'd just say clean job, nice one. Yeah, that was back when the CIA were halfway as competent. Hmm. They could never pull that off now. <laughs> Instead, they're getting kicked out of Nigeria. That's how, things, how far things have fallen. For this yeah, movie. crying probably, yeah. To Ghana. He died in 1972. In the 1950s, in the eyes of the West, his country had been a radiant model for what Africa was to become. But by the time he fell, that image had been replaced by a picture of a continent racked by military coups and corruption. In the late 60s, Western journalists travelled to Ghana to pick over the bones of his industrial experiment. Their contemptuous reports seem to confirm to the West a new myth of Africa, a continent unable to handle the complex pressures of industrialization. Kwame Nkrumah. Well, where's the lie? I mean, he called it a myth, but <laughs> as far as I can see, that is exactly what happened in country after country. With no, any exceptions? I can't think of one. Pro only Botswana. Right. But, I mean, the, re the reasons for that was because they basically... I mean, I'd, I'd hate to say it. They they kept they kept white people in charge down there. They kept the expertise, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, you, you know, they have a, a you know Western style system. But what they did was they didn't uh, they didn't enact kind of governmental controls over key aspects of the economy, which basically meant that you could get individual businessmen, almost all of whom were either former uh british guys who were there or like i said south africa like recently south africans fleeing the anc um and that yeah. is really why botswana is the one kind of success story because they basically just you know they kept that they kept things kind of going out as it was whereas a lot of these other places actually kicked out you know they actually kicked out um europeans and uh uh made it a lot you know i mean curtis has kind of downplayed it but this dude uh was a marxist wasn't he as yeah. well you yeah, know yeah, yeah. So. and curtis like doesn't want to yeah he doesn't want to pass such a harsh judgment on these guys who he probably sees as trying to do the right thing you know mm -hmm. he sees it as a tragedy we see it as a tragedy but also kind of predictable mm -hmm. um I, I would just say like even a lot of more developed countries i mean the soviet union still brought in experts from other parts of the world especially from america and britain uh, yeah. especially during new economic policy but even under probably stalin's time as well um like it it's it's you need to not drive out the, uh, the, you know experts are relatively scarce and you need to attract them and that you know this yeah. is not the way to do it there's a there's a really uh, good speech uh by lenin shortly after he comes into power where he says, like, listen, we need, it's basically like, I can't remember what it's called now, but it's like a reality check. And he says, like, our theories were wrong. We need managers. You can't do without them. We're gonna have to bring yeah. them in. Um, and this and, is, yeah, uh, he's like, they've started killing them. And he's like, wait, we gotta stop killing them. Like, you know. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, a, it's an, I mean, one of the things I'll say about Lenin is that his speeches and his writings are very, very matter of fact. And he doesn't, right. He just says things as they are, you know. So, uh, yeah, it's quite quite amazing. I think it's 1921. It's on that site, Marxist.org. Quite a read. Uh, I often spend my time, uh, you know, one of my long-term hobbies is just, like, reading stuff that Stalin and Lenin wrote on that site. So. That's a, that's, I'm, I'm guessing that's the speech where he calls an end to what they came to call war communism, which was a catastrophe. Um, yeah. You know. Yeah, and, and, and then launched into the new economic policy, which did revive their fortunes somewhat. Yeah. I, which I, was bring back capitalism, basically, to some extent. I, yeah, I think it's 1921, if I'm not mistaken, but don't Sounds quote right. me on that. Yeah. Communist Messiah of Africa, 
came home in 1947 with the clothes he stood up in and a cardboard suitcase. He left 19 years later a multi-millionaire. He turned a 250 million pound credit at independence to a 600 million pound debt and he left Accra studded with expensive white elephants such as this massive saluting base here in Black Star Square. <laughs> It's kind of based. I was kind of based, like uh, you know, it's what we spent all our money on massive monument. Yeah, like Turkmenistan like. did that. I think. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, 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 where's this billion pounds of massive statue of me? You know, saluting. They call it this. They call it like the saluting monument or something. Like, fuck <laughs> it. <laughs> Today, Black Star Square, built by Nkrumah for mass parades to demonstrate enthusiasm for his rule, remains as a bleak reminder of his conceit. Overlooking the square was Job 600, built by Nkrumah specially for the OAU conference in 1965. It's never been used since. So tragic, isn't it? Lame, yeah. It's tragic. So disappointing for the people there. It's just, oh, God. I know it's just a monument to uh, failed economic planning, really. And they have to look at these empty, dilapidating buildings for year after year. I mean, they, they could weren't... have had a, they could have used it for tourism, I guess. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm, what I'm saying is, if I was thinking like, well, what, what could we use this for? Turn it into a luxury hotspot for rich, fat. Western tourists. Casino or something. Yeah, there's got to be yeah, something. Casino there. or zoo or I don't know. There must be safari. There must be something there. You know. I mean, it, once they get into this pit of coups, I think Ghana went on to have literally like another dozen coups after that or something. Um, <laughs> it's just hopeless after after a certain point. It's like I don't know. It's just it just <laughs> you sink to the bottom and then you can't climb at all. It's just terrible. It's grim. It really is grim. This luxury block was to house the Pan-African Congress. They never came. <laughs> there was the Accra Tamer Motorway. Cost six million pounds to duplicate a fast good road already in existence. Oh, <laughs> they say the Russians actually managed to sell snow plows to this state in Equatorial Africa. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is, that is corruption. There's got to be corruption. <laughs> That's fucking... I shouldn't laugh, but you know, we talk about selling uh, sand to the Arabs, the Russians selling snow plants to the Africans. You know? And it's not even that surprising, is it? Oh, man. For Ghana, the years following Nkrumah's fall were ones of economic failure. The dam worked well, but the industrial world that was to have sprung up around it failed to materialise. Those Ghanaians who had been moved to make way for the dam found themselves stranded in the wreckage of Nkrumah's dream. I become quite disgusted because we are directly about three miles from the Volta Dam. But we don't have power. Oh. No electricity, no water. Oh, it's so, so fucking... It is gutting though, isn't it? It's, no, yeah, it's unjust. All the promises and dreams, and you know, he's three miles from the dam. He doesn't even have electricity, and he's got uh, he's got a campfire behind him. I thought know. it might be one of those braziers that is it a, bra a brazier oh, that, that um, so a trade union guys stand around that are striking <laughs> winter. You know, uh, very Curtis arc to this episode, by the way. The hope, but then it failed, <laughs> and then he's not. But the dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Their dreams of a bright new future were dashed. <laughs> so my feeling is that when we have lessons, we can do so much to help the nation. Valco, the Volta Aluminium Company, owned and run by the Kaiser Corporation, flourished. It employed over 1,500 Ghanaians and brought precious foreign exchange into the country. It used most of the dam's electricity and so allowed the World Bank loan to be... <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Might as well no, laugh at this point. I mean, No, no, no. 
So that's why the, that's why the dude didn't have electricity because it's all being used in the. In that, the... That, that, that guy, that English guy earlier, twice he emphasised how warm, like how genuinely warm, the embrace between Nkrumah and Kaiser was, and it's like, yeah. no, <laughs> you just you oh. misread it. <laughs> Kaiser's just having a good time. He's just he's dark. got what he wants. That's it's it. So dark. Paid off without interruption. The smelter became an integral part of Kaiser's worldwide production of aluminium. In a way, we looked at this as a gigantic dry cleaning plant. What we did was we sent alumina from the United States to the smelter. The smelter put electricity through it and took out the, the oxygen, and that made metal. So they were sending the aluminium from America. To melt it there and then to send it back. Um, uh, okay. Uh, it's, it's just, yeah. He said something about Guinea earlier, didn't he? But, you know, that was yeah. probably just nonsense as well. <laughs> In the 1970s, electricity prices soared throughout the world. Although the Ghanaians periodically renegotiated the price Kaiser paid, it remained one of the lowest rates anywhere. This caused increasing resentment. Then, in 1979, there was another military coup, the seventh since Nkrumah fell. Jesus. It was led by a flight lieutenant in the Air Force. Here we go. He was determined to put Ghana back on its feet. Lawrence Fishburne. I must share this fact with you, that Ghana has no money. <laughs> we cannot build a bridge or make a road or give our people water or medicines without borrowing from other countries. We have borrowed so much that for every 100 pounds we earn by selling our cocoa and other exports, we use a sizable proportion, percentage, to pay for some of our debts. We cannot continue to borrow and be in debt all the time. Is he from America? Why has he got the, where's his apple from? And, and like a really English sounding name, isn't it? Jerry Rawlings as well. Yeah, interesting. Rawlings became a popular figure on a par with Nkrumah. His main aim was to lift the burden of debt, and one of the most obvious solutions was to get more money from the smelter. In 1983, his government put together a team. Its task was to persuade Kaiser to renegotiate the agreement signed with Nkrumah. The new government decided to take the bull by the horns and confront Kaiser directly. A number of things made them sit up and listen. I think they were aware at all times that the new government in power was quite prepared to take drastic measures, if necessary, to achieve the objective of a new agreement. Does he mean the possible use of force? <laughs> yeah. For us? Uh, yeah, yeah, I wonder what. Yeah, Curtis doesn't seem to specify. He must have told us um, a bit of a joke. I recall the first day when we met, when we had a lecture from Kaiser about a composer team. We were too many in the room, for instance. And I said, well, you choose your team, we will choose our team. Um, we were young, green, and inexperienced. And I think they underrated us. Valco's management agreed to meet the Ghanaians, but the talk soon became bogged down in disagreement. The Ghanaian team decided to raise the stakes. Then we started to play our master plan we decided that we were going to nationalize. We knew that we wouldn't do it, but we wanted to put it strongly and send up a paper to government for permission to do that. We knew that it would leak out and Kaiser would get the message. See, look, the merchants do fear force for us. They do. Even uh, when it's the Ghanaian government of a two-bit African country, they fear force. I would caution, though, that the story hasn't yet finished. So, well, let's see what happens. <laughs> We've got two minutes left. <laughs> of course, we had another advantage. That was the dam was shut down because of the low level. And we had to decide when to open. And we wouldn't open until we had got a good deal. So Kaiser would be left? With a smelter that was sitting down doing nothing and they would be losing money. Although Kaiser denied that the ploy worked, a completely new agreement was negotiated and signed in January 1985. 
As part of it, the price Kaiser paid for electricity from the dam was increased by nearly three times. The Ghanaian people saw it as a victory for their country. Whereas it form the country, experience has shown that it requires a good deal more than that. It requires a political environment, it requires an, a whole range of international understandings to make it possible to transform the potential which science presents into actual achievement. Look, base fish bird has pulled it off for us. Base yeah, fair enough. Bird. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you were right. They, uh, these guys uh, managed to make to get something out of it. Good on them. See, the fox fears the lion. And regrettably, Ghana was not able to draw upon these other elements to make its vision of science and technology in the driving seat realizable. So it is true that one needs political power, one needs knowledge that is also power, and then one has to combine that with the energy, the electrical power, for us to get to that paradise. Wow, wow, wow. I wonder how Ghana has done since then. I've heard that look. Ghana has some tourism now, like some, you know, Western people go to Ghana for a holiday, I've heard. It can't be that much because I've never met anyone. But, uh, did, um, they're not bad at football. Did old Fishburn stay in power? Let's have a look. Uh, <laughs> let's have a look what happened to him. Well, he started getting film roles in about late 80s, so he was in the King of New York in 1989. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's have a look. Uh, history of Ghana. Let's, let's, uh, uh, there was a coup, there was a coup, there was a coup, there was a coup, there was a coup. Loads. Uh, my gosh. Um, let's have a look. We've got... Uh, current president how far back do you have to go to find fishburn i just want to know whatever right jerry rawlings there he is um he was the president from 1981 to 2001 no. so 20 okay. years 20 yeah. years he had Pretty good. and as far as i can see um country i think has stayed so whatever those guys did was successful by the looks of things because i don't think the ruling the rulings um yeah in, look in tw 2019 he was paid tribute on behalf of the president of the people of ghana he led a delegation to the funeral of Robert Mugabe, blah, blah, blah. So he's still like respected within Ghana. And it does seem like their fortunes have, you know, been rosier since these guys came in. So yeah, nice got, to see a bit of a success story. But uh, the vague impression that it's one of the more successful places in Africa now, I don't really know. But uh, fair play to him. Like, yeah, it sounds like. Um, he sort of stabilised things and mm. uh, got something out of the investment eventually. Um, Let's have a look at Ghana GDP per capita since... Why, what are you, the economist? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just interested to know. Let me have a look. Ghana GDP in constant USD. Sorry about this. Uh, just interested to know. Uh, okay. All right. So this is constant GDP per capita from Fred of Ghana since this time. And there you can see, look, this is what we've, this is most of the documentary that we watched. Right. There's Rawlings comes yeah. in. Oh, well. And look, it's done all right. So he's a legend for them. Fair so play. he is, he is literally their great man. And the lesson is fucking play hard, right? Uh, use what you got, hold them to ransom if you have to. Yeah, use force, nationalize your industry if you must, if you've got your country riddled with American business interests. It seems like Nkrumah was someone with, you know, a vision, but not enough um, wisdom. And, uh... Yeah, I mean, his answer to that question on corruption was very poor. 
<laughs> oh, you need to educate people, and uh, you know that's not that's not the answer at all. Um, I mean, that's 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 what people. You know, if you point out like terrible crimes and like Islamic fundamentalism in Britain, they say, "Well, yeah, we're going to educate them, though." That's how we're going to integrate. It's like, yes, mm. it's Sadiq's answer to knife crime. We need to build more youth clubs. Right, right. Ping pong tables. Yeah. Do you know the the most amazing thing about Sadiq Khan is that when there was that. Uh, murder spree in London. You know, the, do you remember when there was record murders in London a few years back? Mm. He went to Chicago to learn how to deal with this. He what? went to Chicago. What? He, Sadiq Khan, went to Chicago to <laughs> learn about how to tackle crime. To learn how nice to make one. it worse. Nice one, Sadiq. No, i.e., what has Chicago done to curve their, you know, their soaring crime rate? Oh, um, okay. It, I mean, yeah, and then he came back and said, oh, what we need is an awareness campaign and to build more youth clubs. It's absurd. Brilliant. It's absurd. Brilliant. I used to go to a youth club and play ping pong, but I wasn't like expelled or anything or, you know, I wasn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't you know, it didn't keep me away from knife crime. I wasn't going to get into that anyway. No. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> That's the story. Just, just, just a couple of super chats. Uh, Real goat says so much for stolen resources from Africa. I mean, yeah. The Enriab says in 1958, China introduced the Great Leap Forward. But 2,000 miles away, Little Richard chopped the charts with Good Golly Miss Molly. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the UK, Preston Bypass was opened by Harold McMillan. <laughs> Guys. Nice, uh, I remember watching Little Richard. You know, like that at the time would have seemed yeah. almost satanic music to some people. Right? That was like yeah. raunchy and like well, he's a, he was kind of queer as well, wasn't he? But like it was, mm -hmm. it was um, you know just you see yeah. What's that other song he's got? It's like a, it's, it is um, really suggestive. It's funny. Like, yes, tutti yeah. frutti. That's it. That's, <laughs> it's so it's very suggestive. Um, yeah. Uh, anyway. That wasn't really the point of the super chat, was it? C Tony says the Volta Dam project does remind me of today's Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam being built on the Blue Nile. Also, I know what tropical modernist architecture that tropical modernist architecture was popular in Ghana under Nkrumah. So, so there we go. That was uh, another super chat from. Coney, and that that was it. That was it for super chat. So sorry, sorry from from Coney. Uh, Coney, yeah, Coney current year. That's the super chat. So not from Joseph Coney of Coney twenty twelve. <laughs> well, that, that is <laughs> yeah, that is that is indeed the reference. Is his avatar is Joseph Coney? Kudos. Yeah. <laughs> so that is. Uh, yeah, Cody 2012, the very same. Like an our generation uh, meme you know, <laughs> reference. All right, uh, Horace, where can people find you? Uh, where's I'd the best really, place? Yeah, I'd love people to go visit my my Substack. Um, yeah, eternalhorus.substack.com. That is where I am doing the business. Um, and yeah, I'm on Twitter, but uh, you know, lower quality stuff on there. But yeah, uh, it, it's, in, it's at Infinite Horus on Twitter. Uh, I intend to post more serious stuff on there, but I'm just, I'm, my, my creative mind is working better than it's been in years. So I'm just putting all my effort into these essays I'm writing. And if I sort of get a good body of, well, I'm doing a whole series of essays on there. And uh, once I'm sort of pleased with that, then I'll probably post more stuff on Twitter to do with that material to draw people in. But yeah, just go straight to Substack, please, people. Eternalhorus.substack.com. Great. Uh, do buy my courses as well. Promo code MELLO, 25% off uh, for, for Easter, my spring sale. Uh, you know, I, I try to follow the Steam sale. You know, we were talking about uh, New Vegas mm. earlier. Whenever there's a Steam sale, I was like, oh, I better do my sale as well. You know, so. Um, I, I, I really, I've always liked those, uh, the voice, the advert voice that you do in those adverts. I think it's really funny. Um, <laughs> it's, it's what, it's taken from something, it's like, yeah, you're doing it sort of like it's kind of a little bit kind of macho. It's like, du, 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 you know, it's like, it's, it's yeah. Oh, I just like, trying try to do it. everything's pro wrestling with me. I'm trying to channel Vince McMahon, you know, like in my did own. Did you ever way. used to like come across pirate radio stations as well, where they'd have um, adverts for like upcoming raves and club nights and stuff? 
and it'd be like <laughs> in the main arena the, the yeah. newest uk garage sounds in the chill out <laughs> arena you know I, I always like that voice as well <laughs> uh yeah so yeah promo code mellow but most importantly of all uh, i should mention by the way that uh, mellow moments is having a little break at the moment because for some reason since i since i went on gb news i've had a headache my headache has come back and i don't know why so and uh, i've been off coffee this week i'm not having coffee um so uh yeah mellow moments is taking a bit of a break while i'm trying to deal with this headache and it should be back maybe next week all right thank you very much i'll see you on monday for cigar stream now get out everybody thanks a lot for coming on horace thank you what goes on in this town is none of your business as long as i'm living here it is then maybe you shouldn't be living here well, that's easily fixed.